It gets worse. You think that's bad. It's going to get worse. You also have imputed sin. Now, there's a fancy word. We're building our theological vocabulary so we can impress our friends that we probably don't like anyway, but we'll, anyway, we'll try to impress them. All right, here's imputation. Notice on page 137, it is the attribution or the transfer of one person's sin or even one person's righteousness to another. There are three imputations. Call it, think of the word transfer when you think imputation. There are three transfers uh, uh, in the Scripture that are important. You have transfer of sin from Adam to the human race. That's our guilt. When Adam sinned, the idea is we were there with him, in him. He's the representative head, and there is a mystical way in which we are right there with him. And when he sins, uh, we sin too. And so it is then transferred, that guilt is then transferred to us. So there's the transfer of sin from Adam to the human race. That's found in Romans 5. That passage is in full on the left-hand side of the page. There's a second transfer of sin, the sin of the human race to Christ. Now think of it. When Christ was on the cross and dying on the cross, if He dies only a physical death, it's just a sad thing that happened in history. Another man got crucified. Another innocent man died. Something has to make that death incredibly uh, have incredible cosmic significance. And here's what is happening is, when Jesus is dying on the cross, He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the spotless Lamb of God. He is the one who, he, who knew no sin. He was perfectly righteous in His own life. He who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. All of us, Isaiah says, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to His own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity, the sin of all humanity to fall on Him. Such that at that moment in time, all of the sin that had ever been committed by every human being up to that moment, and every sin that would ever be committed by every human being potential in the future, all of the sin of all humanity of all time was focused down at a moment in time when Jesus is hanging on the cross and taking on human sin. That is imputed sin. Adam imputed the guilt of the sin to us because we were in Adam as our representative head. Jesus now has all of our sins collectively imputed to himself in order that he can, he can solve the sin problem. How can a holy God ever restore relationship and fellowship with unholy, blemished man? And it's going to require the transfer of that sin to a sinless sacrifice. You, just, you, can't, you can't even fathom all of those priests under Mosaic legislation, killing all of those animals, sprinkling blood, and all of those things, putting the hands on the scapegoat, sending the scapegoat out into the wilderness, because all of the sins of the nation of Israel were symbolically placed on the scapegoat. And the scapegoat runs out into the wilderness, never once perhaps realizing that they were just simply the shadow of the deeper reality that was coming when the scapegoat would hang on the cross and take on all of the sin of humanity. Now think of it this way. I mean, this, will, this is a heart ripper. Think of the worst sin you've ever committed. Uh, think of some of the deepest, ugliest thoughts you've ever had. S think of some of the, of the filth and refuse that you have covered over and not talked about. Think of your own personal closet of quiet, secret sin that you think nobody knows about. All of the ugliness of all humanity focused at a moment in time on the person of Christ. No wonder, no wonder Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane hours before this would be enacted and say, God, is there a plan B? Well, if it's possible for this cup of not just physical suffering, but this cup of being sin-bearer, 
If it's possible for, for there to be another way of bringing righteousness to the earth and taking care of the sin problem, if there's a way other than me bearing all of that, in His humanity crying out, God, is there another way? But then in His prayer saying, Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Uh, I don't know about you, but I think we're on holy ground. Uh, the most dramatic moment in all of human history right here. Well, that's the transfer of sin of the human race to Christ. But then notice the third transfer. I like this. The transfer of the righteousness of Christ to us as believers. He who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. Now somebody could raise their hand and say, I don't like imputation of sin. Look at... uh, Well, I mean, I I can understand that. But if you believe that, turn the page to page 138. At the bottom, there's a little box. And in that box, we have a statement. If we believe it's not justifiable for us to be counted guilty because of something Adam did, that we were somehow there, that's not fair. Who represented the human race? It must be justifiable that the righteousness of Jesus Christ also cannot be imputed to us by mere belief in Him. If you say, I don't want Adam's uh, uh, sin imputed to me, that's not fair, then you're not going to get it by the same logic. You can't have the imputed righteousness of Christ because he died in your place. It's a package deal. The door swings both ways. Uh, the, the teaching of Scripture, look at the top of the page 138, that chart. There are two things I love in life, charts. And, and various views on any subject. Nine views of this or four views of that. All right, here's a chart. Inherited and imputed sin. Notice what the chart's trying to say. Inherited sin. It went from Adam to his children, from their children to other children, to others to others, till it finally got to me. That's original or inherited sin. It's the state of alienation in which we are all born in. It's transmitted by birth. Right-hand side of the diagram, it went from Adam directly to me. I mean, that was a do not pass gold, do not collect $200. I mean, that's, you go directly to jail, to sin jail. Uh, it goes from Adam, it went directly to Cain. It went directly to Seth. It went directly to every other human being who ever lived. It went from Adam, and it went directly to me. It wasn't passed on by my parents. It came directly to me. It was imputed, transferred to me, because I'm a member of the human race, and the leader of my human race, the federal representative head of the human race, sinned, and therefore I'm considered sinful as well. Okay, that's the transfer. Now, <clears throat> notice on page 139. Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, though, uh, we pretty well talked about that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just assume that you get the concept of, transfer, of, of that transfer or imputed sin. So what have we said thus, thus far? You're a sinner because of original sin that passed through your parents in order that you would have a sin nature. You also have imputed sin directly from Adam to you, and you now have the guilt of sin in your life. But now, thirdly, here's the one we all understand, and we can all have readily agreed to. We have personal sin. So we're a three-way sinner. Top of page 141. Personal sins are committed by everyone. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not even one. Personal sins can either be internal or external. Jesus says it's not just don't commit adultery, don't have lust in your heart. It can be an internal or external because it still is violating the holy character and the moral nature and the uh, universal law or even the law of Christ. It is, uh, it is an offense to an offended God. Three, personal sins are, here's the key phrase, individually committed. So even if you said, eh, I don't know about that original sin, eh, I don't know about that imputed sin, you cannot deny you committed personal sin. Parents, have you ever noticed this? You don't have to teach your children to sin. <laughs> Where'd that come from? Well, it came because they have inherited imputed sin. They're sinners by nature. They're sinners at birth. And so consequently, you don't have to say, Today, Daddy wants to teach you what, what it means to disobey. You've been so obedient. Now let me teach you what it means to disobey. Or, today we're going to talk about sharing. And I want you to start saying mine every time I point to one of your toys. <laughs> Trust me, that's a wasted lecture. It's a part of who we are. 
We are three-way sinners. It's inherited, it's imputed, and we commit individual personal sin as well. Uh, on the left-hand side on page 140, we have, uh, we have a, a chart. Of course we have a chart. We have a chart comparing inherited, imputed, and personal sin. And I want to just point out a couple of features of it. This is a little bit of gristle that you'd want to go back and chew on. We're trying to summarize heavy theological concepts in a way that you begin to get a beginning grasp of it and begin to think about it. Inherited sin, notice the third column, the passing of it, the passage of it, we call it transmission. The passing of it is from generation to generation. In sin did my mother conceive me, Psalm 51, uh, 5. The, 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 the principal result is spiritual death. What's the remedy for spiritual death? Spiritual life. Or as Jesus would say, when a man by the name of Nicodemus came to him at night, Nick at night, okay, we got that out of the way. Nick at night. Uh, Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night, and, and uh, they begin to, a conversation about spiritual things. And then Jesus makes a statement that makes Nicodemus' eyes cross. He said, you must be born again. Well, you're a teacher of Israel, and you don't understand this? Uh, the idea is dead people need life. They need to be born again. And the way you get born again is through faith and trust in the death of Christ on the cross, where you then get imputed righteousness, and it's as if you now are wearing the robes of righteousness, and when God looks at you, He doesn't see you as you really are. He sees you as Christ is, and we now get all of the benefits of the full, complete righteousness of Christ around us as well. We have become the righteousness of God. So there's the remedy. Be born again. Redemption and the gift of the Spirit. Uh, second aspect, imputed sin. Direct from Adam to me. Uh, the penalty of that was physical death. Uh, everybody who, uh, everybody's died. Statistically, one out of one died. Okay, that's as a result of the imputed sin. Everyone dies, and the remedy, as we've already discussed, is imputed righteousness on the basis of faith in the accomplished work of Christ on the cross. Third aspect is personal sin. There's no transmission of that. There's no passage. You do it on your own. You're, you're culpable, you're guilty on your own for that. For the believer, it creates a loss of fellowship with God. If I'm a believer in Christ and all that sin has been forgiven, and I'm walking on a day-to-day -day basis with Him, and then I'm uh, occasionally sinning, uh, going off on my own little rabbit trails and doing my own thing, and then I realize I'm doing my own thing, I confess my sins to Him, I agree with God about it so that I can get back close and walk with Him. It's the difference between fellowship the temporal day-to-day -day walking with God, and relationship, which is an eternal relationship unstained by sin. All right? And so uh, loss of fellowship would be the principal result of sin for the believer. Uh, uh, for the uh, unbeliever, it's normal conduct. I mean, that's just who he is. He doesn't do anything else, doesn't worry about it. The remedy is we need cleansing or forgiveness or restoration of, fellow, of fellowship. Uh, we already have judicial forgiveness uh, in faith in Christ on the cross, but what we need uh, is day-to-day -day fellowship uh, experience with Christ. So, turn the, to the last page. We'll be finished. I'll, we'll have time for just a couple of questions. On the left-hand side, for your personal devotions. We're not going to do it, and I'm not going to lead it. This hymn, old ancient hymn, God Be Merciful to Me, is sung to Rock of Ages. Now, everybody in the room right now, in their mind, is singing that, God be merciful. All right, you do that later. This is a part of your personal, your own personal devotion. But I would point out, this hymn is built upon the great confession of uh, King David after his sin with Bathsheba. And, and it is magnificent. I, I've, uh, uh, I've been singing it. I can't take it in the shower. It messes up the paper. But, uh, but I've been singing this around my house. Uh, also, on the right-hand side... We have a concluding thought uh, of All Have Sinned by Wayne Grudem. That's worthy of you reading and contemplating later. We finished the discussion with this. Last week we talked about anthropology, the doctrine of man. We now have brought in the ugliness of the doctrine of sin. Both of those together give us a full understanding that we are created in the image of God and that is balanced with we are depraved sinners as well. 
and you have to hold them in balance. If you only hold on to the fact you're in the image of God and you try to minimize your sinfulness, then you're out of balance as a believer. If you think that everybody is filth, everybody's uh, dung, everybody is garbage and refuse, and you ignore the fact you're created in the image of God, you are out of balance in that. We have to have a biblically balanced understanding that, yes, we are in the image of God, though marred and stained and tarnished, but also that we have to acknowledge the reality of the fact that we are three-way sinners. And we need the grace of God that has been already expressed at the cross. We need the benefits of the accomplished work of Jesus, the sin bearer on the cross. And that ought to make us fall to our knees in humble adoration and deep commitment. Ought to. But that's why we're sinners. And so, consequently, maybe we've elevated our understanding and appreciation for what Jesus has done. Father, for the goodness of life, we say thank you. For the depth of the Scripture, we're amazed and humbled. Uh, increase our understanding, we pray. In Christ's name, amen.